So like I was saying, when we first scheduled this, it was just a crisis in Ukraine, and then roughly 18 hours later became a war. So clearly this has escalated very quickly. And my role as I see it tonight is I am going to give, at least in my presentation, a fairly narrow presentation. You may make fun of me later for what I consider narrow. But what I am trying to do is present at least a story to you understand what the internal dynamics of Ukraine have been, the internal dynamics of Russia, thinking of why and how this way, and then what about it. I still think I'm presenting a very simple story. What I'm relying on you here in person, as well as online, is to complicate that story with your questions. So do not think that the presentation is all that I know. I'd like to think I've read at least two books, but the whole point is that I want this to be a, a, a presentation to where after the fact, you are able to observe the events that will follow and inform and at least have a better background than what the news is able to do in a five minute segment. Now, fundamentally, when we think about what will happen, I certainly anticipate we will be doing other events to interpret the events as they unfold, certainly at least one more by the end of the semester, because this will have ramifications as we'll see in this presentation. But before I get started, let's start with the most common questions. Oh, we, we're, we are going to click through this. You are kidding, there we go, okay. Before we get started, is it Kyiv or Kiev? It's a difference in language. Kyiv is Ukrainian, Kiev is Russian. Fundamentally, Russian speakers do go in between in Ukraine. We have updated officially and call it Kyiv to give notoriety and respect to the Ukrainian language. But if you accidentally slip and say Kiev, that does not mean you suddenly support Putin's war. It means you're just saying it in Russian. So you're a polyglot, that's perfectly fine. The bigger issue is if you say the Ukraine, because that denotes linguistically that you view it to be a, a place that is not in its own. Basically means that it's just a place to be conquered, essentially. Ukraine is to recognize it as an independent idea. So that is the linguistic thing to drill in. It's not the Ukraine, it is Ukraine. So that being said, when we consider the dynamics of where we are today, we do need to look into the 20th century, and I expect this will create a collective groan, but one of the things of teaching and certainly wanting to lecture on this on a university campus is that the vast majority of people on this campus were born in the 21st century. So I have to go a little back to explain this. When we think of the Soviet Union and the Cold War, this is obviously a stylized map from 1950, but I think it fits what a lot of Americans understand which is here is a massive state hovering over the top of Eurasia, seemingly a monolith. When we actually look within the Soviet Union, it is a federal system. The Soviet Union was comprised of 15 Soviet republics. So yes, it was still an authoritarian state, highly centralized, but we do end up seeing that throughout the Soviet Union, there is a constant question of what do we do about Ukrainian nationalism? What do we do about the people of Uzbekistan? So these are questions that the Soviets were asking and we still ask them after the Cold War ends and the USSR dissolves. When we think about where this all got started, we actually have to go back a little bit further. And my apologies to any historian in the room because to understand some of the, some of the explanations given by Vladimir Putin himself, we have to understand that Kievan Rus in the 900s, a millennium before, this is really the birthplace of Russian civilization. Initially starting here in Veliky Novgorod, and then eventually spreading down to where Kiev becomes the principal state in this early medieval state, essentially. One of the largest in Europe, highly connected in global trade. But fundamentally, this is the state that decides to convert to Christianity and adopting orthodoxy. This is the beginning of Russian civilization. And it does begin primarily in Kiev. So when we consider Vladimir Putin's claims that Ukraine cannot exist independently because it is Russian, he's going back this far in history to make that claim. We should be very skeptical of anything that stays constant for a millennium. When we think about the development of Kievan Rus, eventually the Mongol uh, invasion ends the state of Kievan Rus. We see that political and economic power drift to Northeast and essentially we eventually get to where Moscow becomes the principal state. It begins to conquer the states around it. 
we get the early Russian empire, the large Tsarist empire, then the Soviet Union. And then we get what today are the modern day borders of Ukraine. Now, these are still an artifact of the 20th century. The Western borders of Ukraine reflect World War II, World War I, certainly very recent conflict when we consider this long history. But nevertheless, we still have the argument at least being made by Putin himself that this border is a mistake, that that is an artifact of the 21st century and they are permanent and they are correcting it in real time. This is part of his argument. I have a lot of issues with the argument. We all should, we should mm -hmm, keep that in mind. But I want to make sure that we understand how Russia and Ukraine go from being the Soviet Union, being in a federal system, actually understand that each other exists, seem to actually recognize that in the Soviet Union, how do we get to where we are today? We're gonna do this very quickly. What do you do without the Soviet planned economy in which Moscow decides how much we produce, what is supply, what is demand, and what is the price? How do you transition from that centralized and economic system to something that is open to capitalism and the market. Each of the 15 Soviet republics, they approach this question totally differently. Some do not give up state control. Some go crazy towards laissez-faire. I am oversimplifying when I say this, but Ukraine and Russia largely follow the same path. That path is privatize. Sell these state-owned assets and use that sale money as revenue so that way the state gets some cash, but we start to open up the economy and we let the market function. So states, both Russia and Ukraine, start to sell mines, start to sell factories, start to sell energy stations and refineries. The problem is the market, the global market does not understand how to price these assets appropriately. It's not clear what is the quality of the mine, what is the quality of this factory. So what we see is that these sales people are able to buy massive assets for pennies on the dollar. This creates the 1990s as Russia and Ukraine experienced it. Americans remember the 1990s as a great point. I cannot describe how horrific the 1990s are for Russians and Ukrainians. You go from having a reasonable retirement to no retirement whatsoever. Provi healthcare that is free and widely available to suddenly constricted and possibly cost you money. Schools uncertain, uh, wages uncertain, the value of your currency is going up and down. The 1990s is horrific. It's so bad that life expectancy drops in both countries because of people not being able to get medical care, drinking themselves to death, uh, suicide rates nearly quadruple. The 90s are not good. In that background, with assets being sold for pennies on the dollar, we get oligarchs. They manage to get maybe a factory and that becomes productive, they can buy another one. They build empires. And this is how in the, in the desire to get a market, we get a concentration of economic power in both Ukraine and in Russia. So we're gonna step into Russian political development. And this is my dissertation. I lived in Russia for two years. I've been studying it for a long time. I'm a sad old man. I am telling you a very simple story. My entire work is about how this story is wrong, but I just need to get it out there. So starting in 1999, we see the first president, Boris Yeltsin, uh, resigns in, very suddenly at the end of his second term. Vladimir Putin was prime minister at the time, so constitutionally, he became president. So suddenly, he goes to being president of Russia, and he has an election to win in nearly nine months. But he manages to do so. By comparison to Boris Yeltsin, he speaks clearly, he's confident, he's disciplined, he's healthy, he's young, he looks great on TV, Russians love him. In 2001, a political party, United Russia, is created to help support Vladimir Putin. In 2004, Vladimir Putin wins his second presidential election. He still maintains a considerable amount of popularity at this point in time. But shortly after this election, there is the best law on terrorist attack in which terrorists uh, take over an elementary school on the first day of school and kill 300 children. This terrorist attack becomes an impetus for Muslim, uh, for a lot of Islamophobia, for uh, a considerable national mourning. And so what this allows is Vladimir Putin uses this as a means to centralize political power. 
And so this goes to an extreme where for several years, governors cannot be directly elected. Moscow picks them. That's a very centralized state. So this horrific moment nevertheless presents itself as a political opportunity to centralize political control. 2007, United Russia, the party created to help support Putin, wins the largest parliamentary election total ever, 67% of the parliament. They have a super constitutional majority. They can change the constitution anytime they want. In 2008, however, there is a constitutional limit. Putin is at his second term. You can only serve two terms. So he steps down to the prime minister position and his prime minister, Dmitry Medvedev, becomes president. And then using that constitutional supermajority, they change the term limits. So now it's not four years for the presidency, it's six. This starts to really anger the Russian people. And in 2011, they decide they're done with United Russia and they try to vote against the regime. Widespread fraud. And despite the unpopularity, United Russia receives 49% of the votes in an election widely seen as fraudulent. And this creates the, the largest protests in post-Soviet history in Russia. Over 100,000, somewhere between 100,000 and 500,000 people in Moscow march. It's a nationwide outrage. But Putin is seen as being above it. His cult of personality allows them to say, I don't control the party, I am my own thing. And people say, yes, you're wonderful, but your party is terrible. And that's how he's able to kind of skate past that. And he's reelected the following year to his first six year term because they changed the term limits so he can go again. He's reelected in 2018. Between these elections, Russians vote in increasingly lower numbers. They vote less than Americans do. That is not a good thing. We do not vote very much at all. So in 2020, uh, during COVID, they host a national vote to amend the Russian constitution and they change a few things. The Supreme Court of Russia rules that by changing the constitution, you reset the term limits. So this means that Putin has the potential to rule till 2036 under the current laws. How old is he? He's in his 60s. He can do it. Um, no worries. So in summary, he's able to centralize political authority by reigning in oligarchs and co-opts those oligarchs into the system. I won't go after your wealth, but you pay for my campaigns, or if I need money for anything, you give it in. Whole system of political patronage and corruption. When we think about this party of power, United Russia is key to understanding the power that Vladimir Putin can, can claim. One, it's horizontal. He controls the executive branch and the legislative branch simultaneously. The Russian parliament is a rubber stamp body. So there's no check on power, despite the Russian constitution being designed to actually provide a lot of checks on power, a one powerful party can override that. It's also vertical. United Russia wins almost every election everywhere, from the federal level, to the regional level, to your city, to your village, you cannot escape United Russia. They are good at rigging elections and they are good at making sure that other candidates cannot win. So how in the world can he be one of the most popular world leaders over the last 25 years? In his first two terms alone, the Russian economy tripled in size. If you go from being a state that cannot convince its citizens to live another day, then you have the Russian Federation in the 1990s was losing nearly 800,000 people a year in population shrink because of the problems in the 1990s. He is offering stability. The power that conveys, we really can't conceive of it in the United States. But also into the 21st century, high energy, high commodity prices, it allows the federal government to actually have money to do things. They can get engaged in international affairs. If you go from being a superpower where everyone listens to you to a poor state that no one really cares about, being able to matter on the world stage, it matters. Similarly, this also creates the opportunity, and this is a wonderful world to create a word to create a kleptocratic state, klepto to steal, ocracy, rule by, rule by theft. It creates a state that is highly interested in skimming off the top because there's such profits to be made from energy and commodities. 
over time, we also see that there is no answer to the question, who else? There is not one opposition candidate that could possibly compete with Vladimir Putin. The closest one, the one I think everyone has heard of, Alexei Navalny, who was poisoned and went to Germany and that back and forth, he's not necessarily the best guy. He really has made a lot of statements that he thinks Muslims shouldn't really live in Russia. And there's 14 million of them. That is a problem. He's expressed some deeply nationalistic views. He doesn't like Vladimir Putin, but he's not exactly the best guy. So when it comes to if you disagree with Putin, where do you turn? There is not an answer. So you stop voting. You stop participating. This leads to the situation we're in today. So what about Ukraine? I'm going to prep you right now. You're going to hate Ukrainian presidents' names. They are designed to confuse Americans. I'm so sorry, but get ready. The first one is Leonid Kravchik. Uh, has his first term uh, after the Soviet Union. Basically cannot win re-election because of corruption allegations that are largely true. Then we have the other Leonid, Leonid Kuchma, and he runs for several terms. This is when the oligarchy really gets established. And we see deep ties between Ukrainian oligarchy and Russian oligarchy, very similar systems of kleptocracy. The difference is in the same point in time, while energy prices and commodity prices are increasing, Ukraine does not have those resources. It cannot make the same amount of money. It cannot build as stable a political system as United Russia, as Vladimir Putin is able to do. But the Ukrainian people are very upset with this development. And so at the end of Kuchma's second term, we have what we call the Orange Revolution. On the left, we have the candidate Viktor Yanukovych versus the other presidential candidate, Viktor Yushchenko, and his running mate, Yulia Tumashenko. Viktor and Yulia were political opponents. They came together to make sure they could beat Yanukovych. Yanukovych was running a status quo platform. Let's stay close to Russia, things are fine. Victor and Yulia said, no, Ukraine is an independent state. We should be moving towards Europe. Very Ukrainian nationalist. The election is unbelievably difficult. Viktor Yushchenko, he has an assassination attempt. He's poisoned with dioxide, and that is why his face is pockmarked. There's allegations as to who tried to kill him. It's not sure, but he comes out of the hospital and keeps running for president. When we talk about Ukrainian strength, it shows itself pretty early. Eventually, it's declared that Viktor Yanukovych wins. The people revolt. They go into the streets. The Supreme Court rules against it. And eventually, Viktor Yushchenko is elected president. This really terrifies the Putin administration back in Russia. Suddenly, they can't control U Ukrainian elections. So they begin to work behind the scenes to help fund and build a party of power in Ukraine. And eventually, after his first term, Viktor Yanukovych is able to take advantage of that support and win the presidency. So what we end up seeing is a back and forth between presidencies. This is not the system we see in Russia. And it really comes down to the fact that Ukraine does not develop an independent economic bastion of its own. It relies on Russia too much. And the oligarchy is too powerful. When we talk about Ukrainian politics, I didn't even want to dignify them by putting up on this map. There is always this description of Ukraine. It is a country split in two that it should never be one. And it's patently false. What they will focus on is, I'm just going to walk because it's fun. What they're going to focus on is the fact that this is largely Russian speaking on the right side of the Dnieper River. On the left side, that is mostly Ukrainian speaking. Ethnically, these are mostly ethnic Russians. To the West, mostly ethnic Ukrainians. When we look at how they vote, they vote differently. Uh, the, the East tends to vote for pro-Russia candidates. The West tends to vote for pro-EU candidates. So it seems that they are constantly at odds. I would push against that with the, everything I can possibly muster to say that it's because politics is difficult. Eastern Ukraine's entire industry is tied to Russia's. It, it's tied to Russia's. When they trade, they trade with Russia. They need a close relationship with Russia to survive. So the East is totally fine with going to the EU, but please don't threaten our relationship with Russia. Meanwhile, to the West, the EU is expanding ever eastward. It comes to Western Ukraine's borders. They are trading with the EU. So the West sees the future here. The East doesn't disagree, but it's kind of stuck in the present. How do we move forward? This is the constant back and forth of Ukraine but they do arrive at consensus, and this creates the Euromaidan protests. So in 2013, 
the Yanukovych administration hired, or I mean, well, kind of hired by Russia, but they're a pro-Russia group. Consensus has been achieved in Ukraine. They want deeper ties with the EU. So they start to negotiate an association agreement. This means that you can have one trade deal with the entire EU, not just bilateral. It lets you trade with everybody. It's a nice thing to get. Immediately, Russia changes their customs orders and do not accept Ukrainian exports. This causes the Ukrainian economy to crater. Within a week, they lose 10% of their exports. So at the negotiating table, Ukraine requests, please give us money to cover this economic loss. The EU comes back with 1 20th of what was requested. But Russia offers exactly what they wanted, plus a discount on natural gas prices, and you don't have to reform or do anything. So political consensus was made, and suddenly the Yanukovych administration takes the cash. The Ukrainian people are outraged. So we get nationwide protests. Now, Euromaidan in 2014, we tend to focus on this story in Kyiv. It is nationwide. Every major city has a protest. But it is the protest in Kyiv that generates the horrible casualties of over 100 people. And eventually, the pressure gets such that President Yanukovych steps down on February 21st, 2014. And this is where it gets interesting. Six days later, little green men pop up in the Crimean Peninsula. They seize the Ukrainian naval base. They seize TV stations, police stations, and the regional parliament. They disband the regional parliament. They put a man in power who is the leader of a party that only has 4% of the vote. And he declares that we are now independent and we'd like to join Russia. The little green men, they are in green army fatigues without insignias. It's not clear where they come from. We know where they came from. We all know where they came from. But there was plausibility, deniability, and a concern of agitating Russia. So March 16th, a referendum is held on the peninsula, results of which say overwhelmingly, let's join Russia. You can imagine these are fraudulent returns. March 21st, Russia officially annexes the Crimean Peninsula. Within a month, they seize it. That's unbelievably fast. No blood spilled, but effective. Then to the east, in Donetsk and Luhansk, we end up having both cities separatist seize control. This is a local thing. Russia is not part of this. They seize control and they declare self-rule. They start to physically fight the Ukrainian state and the Ukrainian army. They hold a referendum. It's conducted, says, let's join Russia. The war begins. Initially, Russia has nothing to do with it. They do casually suggest that if you'd like to volunteer, you're more than welcome to go. I was living in Russia at this point in time. I went to a meeting about people wanting to sign up. It was a bizarre meeting. Uh, they also said there's Americans in every room and they're all CIA and I was trying to blend in as a Russian, so I got very scared. <laughs> but the war begins and initially it's just with this volunteer support, but eventually the Russian state starts to send material, starts to send experts, starts to directly support this insurrection. So this starts in 2014. This is the war beginning. It has not ended. We might be waking up to the war in Ukraine. Ukraine has been fighting a war for a long time. So after Euromaidan, we get Petro Poroshenko, who's a billionaire, one of the oligarchs, owns a lot of chocolate factories, um, but he's deeply unpopular. He's got a lot on his plate, so he only has one term. And then we have Volodymyr Zelensky is elected and is the most uh, recent president, an unusual candidate. Um, not exactly the best president, sort of, he's pretty thin skinned. He does not like the media. He really does not like critiques. Um, a lot of people didn't like his foreign policy to begin with. However, he was nevertheless clearly the leader of the moment and has been an inspiration for the world, despite really having a career as a comedian. So Ukrainian politics, it does draw out the best in everybody. So, okay, but why invade Ukraine now? If a war has been since 2014, why now? I argue because things got a little easier. In Belarus, due north of Ukraine, another post-Soviet Republic in which President uh, Lukashenko, who in the media is described as the last dictator in Europe, he has massive protests against his reign in 2020. He overly fraudulently uh, packs the ballots. Like it's something like he won accidentally like 98% of the vote. Like it's bad. 
So people protest because at the exact same time, his state recognizes that COVID is a thing and refuses to try to do anything for its citizens. The two things combined, the Belarusian people are over it. But Lukashenko is a dictator for a reason. He arrests 35,000 protesters, tortures them. We end up seeing that in order to end the protests, he calls Russia directly and Russia assists in sending material officers, they assist in the repression. So now Lukashenko is completely dependent on Moscow to survive. And on Sunday, they did a national vote, reformed their constitution to where now Lukashenko is more, po is more powerful, at least legally, and they officially got rid of their military neutrality that was in their constitution. This is why Monday there were concerns that Belarus would also invade. That's still possible, but this is what happens when authoritarian leaders can run them up. In Kazakhstan, in January of this year, we saw that the presidents changed. We went from President Azerbaijan to President Tokayev, and there was essentially a revolt of elites. They were worried that Tokayev was going to come after their wealth, so we saw massive riots. In order to end the riots, Kazakhstan calls Russia, and Russian troops come in to help put down the riots. So now Kazakhstan is very dependent on Moscow. So you've got two of the major post-Soviet republics, and you kind of want Ukraine in your pocket. Now's a good time. And us. Political polarization in the, in the US, as well as Putin's popularity with nationalists in the EU, he thought he could fracture. He thought we would not be able to build a coherent response. Obviously, a little mistake. So I have this slide because what is the Russian perspective? Did we have a role in this? From the Russian perspective, we think about the Cold War, if it was NATO versus the Warsaw Pact, and the Cold War is over, the Warsaw Pact disappears. What is NATO fighting against? That is an open question. And Russia feels you won the war, we're not the adversary anymore. So disband NATO. We don't. We expand it. We bring it closer and closer to Russia, and we give no signal that we want them to ever join. That feels like encirclement. That's part of their claim. Now that can be a legitimate claim that doesn't mean you go invade another country, obviously, but this is part of the framing, that they do not trust us, that we frame them to always be the enemy. When we look at how the UN Security Council negotiations have been going recently, we see repeatedly our invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq are brought up as, you cannot lecture us about invading places. Look in your own backyard. And they do have a point on this. It certainly is a different picture. Why does the world care about Ukraine and not Iraq? That's kind of an unfair question. Because in 2003 was the world's single largest anti-war protest in global history. Three million people marched in Rome alone against the US invasion. We were deeply unpopular for that decision. I would highlight, however, one of the big differences between this, we were a democracy having the debate for war. People knew domestically we had the debate. We brought it to the UN, we had the debate. Did we lose in the UN? Did we act unilaterally? Yes. That, that haunts us in international relations. But when we went to war, what was our collective thing as Americans? We got to evaluate, do we want this war still? Do we want to vote for somebody else? Do we want to protest? We had the capacity to do all of this. Russians cannot. It was a secret war. It remains largely secret. Russians are not getting accurate information and they cannot protest and they cannot try to vote for somebody else. So ironically, by bringing up the invasion, yes, you are bringing up some very good points on American foreign policy. However, we'd like to see your editorials on the war in Ukraine. This is a point why Ukraine is fighting for its independence. So what has our response been? One of the big things that I think as Americans that we've been confused by is, oh my God, for the last two weeks, there's just been so much information. Russia's gonna invade, Russia's gonna invade, Russia's gonna invade, but they're not doing it. So we're making it up. The reason for doing this is that in 2014, when it came to the Crimea, there was no narrative against the Russian narrative that the little green men were just random guys. We knew better, but we were unwilling to declassify that information. We have been frantic in declassifying information. We are doing our best to make sure that Russia cannot control the narrative. But that makes it, as a free society, we're getting a lot of information. It's deeply confusing. But it's to make sure that Putin cannot declare what reality is. We've been working very hard to ensure the lack of cooperation. So we've been very clear for weeks. We're not sending any troops to Ukraine. 
because we do not want to trigger Article 5 of NATO, which requires that all NATO members go to the defense of whoever was attacked. We are trying to just keep this war limited. So that gets to this immense diplomatic effort to ensure that all of our allies are acting as one. And this has been a radical success. This is an unusual success. I think even as Americans watching it, Exxon Mobil's getting out of the oil business in Russia. They've been there since 1995. Like this is a huge shift. And we're also balancing multiple coalition partners' exposure to sanctions. Sometimes we often hear in the US, why aren't we going harder? And the answer is, we are less exposed to the effects. Europe is deeply connected to Russia. So if we hurt them, we hurt our allies. So we are trying to do things together as one and trying to make sure that we're not disproportionately harming an ally. This is very difficult. So the big question is, will the sanctions work? And this has been evolving I had totally different slides uh, over the weekend. Sanctions tend to fail, but it's because we expect too much from them. We expect that if we make life hard for everyday citizens, then they'll go and protest and we'll get a new regime and the world is great again. That has never happened. What sanctions do, however, they do pressure regimes. They do limit regimes. But to expect changing trade to suddenly equal we don't get authoritarianism, that is a harder sales pitch. So sanctions work, they just don't do everything we want them to. However, what we're doing to Russia has never been done before. And as a central banker described it in an interview recently, it's weapons of mass financial destruction. There was no idea that we would be willing to do this or that we could do it. And we surprised ourselves that the world was gonna go for this. Russia prepped for this. The central bank had amassed $680 billion in assets to be able to handle sanctions. Because of SWIFT, because of central bank sanctions, the value of that $680 billion, what they can actually spend, is roughly $30 billion. That has also caused the ruble to collapse. They cannot control their own economy. So will sanctions work? This is brand new. No one has ever done this. We have no idea what this means. Does this mean that the Putin regime actually gets more desperate and quadruples down on their bet because there's nothing left to save? That's possible. We don't know the consequences. Russian people themselves blindsided. So the Russian people themselves know that the ruble is, is crashing. And if they go out and protest, they'll be arrested. How do they maintain a job and an economic, like it's too much to risk. This is one of the reasons we tend not to get regime change through sanctions. The people get desperate and they just want to survive. They stop caring about politics. But the sanctions can hurt our allies more than us. For example, uh, I think at this point in time, it's six EU states rely on Russia for 100% of their natural gas. Italy relies on Russia for roughly 80% of its oil. They are willing to start putting sanctions on Russia. They mean this. But this is why we haven't gone, over the, gone after the energy sector immediately, because we would send all of the EU into an economic recession. So we're, we're trying to pace ourselves. But when we think about how Russia matters to the world, if we went full crazy with brutally, brutal sanctions, it would be global devastation. Russia is the world's number one grain exporter. If we go harder and we make it illegal to take Russian grain, we'll probably send 1 billion people into hunger. Egypt alone relies on Russia for 70% of its grain. You don't want Egypt destabilized. You don't want people starving. So we have to find a way to punish selectively and hard, but we can't do everything. This is one of the ways where sanctions can feel ineffective because you know you can do more. But you really have to question, should we? Nevertheless, unbelievable tension has been put on the Putin regime domestically, internationally, in a matter of days. This has been crazy fast. In international politics, I've ne I don't know what has ever moved this fast. But their original bet from the beginning is that y'all can't actually keep up. You can do it in six days, but in six months, you're gonna look at oil prices and you're gonna say it's not worth it. And you're gonna back down. And we're an autocracy. We are an authoritarian regime. We could care less. That's the bet. We'll see whether that pans out in the medium term. But how is this Russia's plan? Everything I've seen says they were trying to redo Crimea. 
everything I've seen suggests that they were trying to use their military to intimidate. They're going to take an airport, paratroopers take out Zelensky, you get a new regime in, they rubber stamp some stuff through and they say, wow, we really need Russia to protect us. The military comes in and says, oh, thank God we're on your border. And then that ends it. But we can see how incredibly violent that is to invade another state, to go after their sovereignty, which is sink, like, ah, that is the utmost rule in international relations, the sovereignty of states. They needed to be able to do that in 48 hours because what they were doing breaks every rule of international relations. They couldn't do it in 48 hours and now look at the world response. There was also reports that the Russians assumed the Ukrainian people would be friendly. We can sympathize. We said the Iraqi people would greet us as liberators. It's harder to maintain that warm friendliness when after you might free them from tyranny in the case of Iraq, now what are you going to do? That's a bigger question that we were not ready to answer. In the case of Ukraine, clearly they knew what the answer was. They had decades of experience. They wanted to be independent. They know what this is about. This is why they're fighting so hard. They're not new to this question. So the lesson to be learned, yes men are the worst men. Surround yourself with people that disagree. Uh, when couples fight, it's because they're trying not to be Vladimir Putin, let's keep that up. So what do the Russian people think? No indication from any survey data that they thought Ukraine was a threat. At no point did Russia think, or the Russian people think Ukraine is a problem. A foreign enemy doesn't even reach the top 20 concerns in the survey data from the last two years. Russian state news cannot use the word war and do not use the word war. They use the phrase a special military operation. If they use the word war, the, uh, essentially the Ministry of Justice will assume that is a national security leak and will seize everything. So even the newspapers receive the same directive, but when it comes to state news, the vast majority of Russians watch TV. Uh, for the lone exception of one TV station, every TV station is state owned or owned by the state oil company. They don't know what's happening. No casualties are being reported. And they do see some of the videos that we see of rocket attacks. Their news broadcasts broadcast that rocket attack and say, look where the sun is. That missile obviously came from the Northeast. You saw it. We don't have forces in the Northeast. It's propaganda. So they are constantly combating this. We still don't know the number of casualties. We're guessing. We think roughly 2,500 Russian soldiers have died so far, we think. But none are being reported in Russian news. They don't know what's happening. The Russian people are increasingly frightened because their economy is in a tailspin, but they don't know what to do. If they protest, they get arrested. Oh, nearly uh, 8,000 people have been arrested. The Russian people are also strong, but they are scared. It, is, it appears to be deeply unpopular, but what do you do? So Russians are simply fighting a war they don't want to, and they're not sure how to stop it because they're very convinced that if Vladimir Putin's regime doesn't care about Ukrainians, why would they care about Russians either? So they saw this, but is this World War III? Um, no, or at least probably not, which is a Cold War mentality. I know I've been using this phrase, but uh, Cold War mentality, you're going to be safe today, tomorrow, but maybe not the day after. And that is a deeply uncomfortable uh, sense, but for those that experienced the Cold War, it was weird doing missile drills and hiding under your desk thinking this wood thing is gonna save me from a nuclear blast. And eventually you press that to the back of your brain. So when it comes to this, we have this sense of escalation because this is the biggest escalation in violence in Europe since World War II. So we go there. We're doing everything possible not to. NATO has been reinforced, but NATO has been very clear that we are not going to engage and try to save Ukraine. And Ukraine knows that, much to their sadness. Uh, the nearly universal response has certainly taken not only Russia by surprise, but Ukraine as well. I mean, again, uh, I know I was talking with my students in class today, to think about the fact that, okay, the EU or NATO going against Russia, sure. But again, oil companies, that's the last people I thought would be like, you know, this is one thing too far. That's not in the logic, and oil prices are, are where they're at. That doesn't make market sense. But this is overwhelming decision-making in the last few days. So the phrase I use to describe what's next is, we cannot be surprised by. Because I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know what's gonna come next, but we can extrapolate some possibilities. So if these happen, you cannot claim, well, I didn't know. We can't be surprised, but if they happen, we can say, well, I get, oh, that, that is interesting. One, 
populist nationalists in the EU who previously adored Putin are really having to backtrack. For example, the third largest party in France is Front National. They're a uh, far right nationalist. They tend to say pretty anti-Semitic things, pretty xenophobic things, not exactly the nicest people. Um, so much so that French banks the last election cycle would not loan the money for their campaign, but Russia did. That's awkward for them now. Um, similarly, uh, Salvini is a parliamentarian in Italy, like to go to parliament wearing a t-shirt with Putin's face on it and being like, this is my guy. Awkward for him. Um, Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, has openly said he wants to run an illiberal democracy. He wants to do what Putin has. And Viktor Orban in Hungary has been wildly successful despite being an EU country. He's built a party of power, Fidesz. He's also made sure that there is not one independent news source left in Hungary. There is no free press in all of Hungary. Wildly successful. He was in Moscow last month and gave a speech saying, Russia's fears about Ukraine are justified. He's now running for election in April. If he loses, Vladimir Putin loses his best ally in the EU. This is deeply uncomfortable for Vladimir Putin. He's losing allies in the EU. But he thought that these people would be able to complicate the political story. They can't. So we might see a stronger commitment to the democratic world, perhaps increased interest in renewable energy as a result of looking at just how dependent we are. We often say this, we thought the Iraq war would maybe generate this, we will see. But certainly for the EU, it's generating this on a very different level. But this is the big one. So this is the, the most complicated thing we're gonna walk through. And I've talked about this several times, but I'm going to keep talking about it because it matters. In 1994, there was a Budapest memorandum when the Soviet Union dis, uh, ends up dissipating and we have 15 independent states, the problem is the political authority has dissipated. Your nuclear weapons did not. They're scattered across the territory of the former USSR. So when the USSR uh, collapses, uh, the US has the most nukes, nukes in the world, Russia has the most nukes in the world, and Ukraine has the third most. So there's an attempt to convince Ukraine to give up the nuclear weapons. In 1994, the US, UK, and Russia agree that if anyone threatens Ukraine's sovereignty, we will defend it. Obviously, Russia found a way in loopholes and they have found a way to claim that they didn't break the memorandum, but I mean, come on. Um, but also, we are using that as a reason to not live up to this agreement, that Russia broke it, not us, but we don't have to do anything. So what does this tell states? Keep your nukes. Ukraine wouldn't be invaded if they had nukes. This has only gotten worse. 2014, this lesson was already echoing. This is one of the reasons why uh, Ukraine was so important in the Trump impeachment trials, because they're messing with this, this logic. And so it's definitely gotten worse. So we will likely see mid-tier states trying to go nuclear. And certainly this was a concern when we were thinking about Taiwan, but we're thinking about Japan, South Korea, but also states, we're currently about to renegotiate the nuclear deal with Iran, lifting sanctions so they won't go after the nuke. Looking at Ukraine right now, you might just say, we'll go with the nuke, thank you. That's dangerous for the world. So in conclusion, I told you, <laughs> oh really, that was narrow, Dr. Johnson, really. Um, so uh, international relations is understanding multiple perspectives, it's complicated. Obviously. The war in Ukraine is illegitimate and the world knows it. Uh, Putin has assured that Ukrainian identity is actually severed from Russian. It's unbelievable. The amount of uh, suffering that Ukraine has experienced in the 20th century, they still had an idea that Russia had their back. And they've lost it this, this intensely, this quickly. It's unbelievable how Putin was able to de destroy something where there's nearly 20 million families in Russia that have direct relatives in Ukraine. They are linked societies. They are complete, they don't have an issue. Suddenly Vladimir Putin has divided them. So it's not just Ukrainians who are suffering and will suffer, Russians suffer too. The Putin regime is making sure, unfortunately, that multiple societies will suffer because of one decision. And it's, I would argue, because of this administration's fragility, its incompetence, and its arrogance. So I wanted to alert you to a couple of things. One, 
this will be recorded and it should be put online. There are others from this series have been recorded, but I think this will be a particularly good panel. So that way you can check and see like, wow, <laughs> Professor Johnson's an idiot uh, because I watched these. And so these are going to be good. Former US ambassador to NATO, Dr. Fiona Hill, who wrote the, bio the biography on Vladimir Putin, an excellent expert in Russian politics. And Dr. Elise Sorat, who is a wonderful historian, the, and her work actually demonstrates how purposefully the West was wanting to shut Russia out. Her books demonstrate that in 1989, we made the conscious choice that Russia must suffer for the Cold War, which if you remember World War I into World War II, that's a really weird conclusion to draw, given that we had learned that you don't punish the state that was the aggressor. You try to help them rebuild into something better. We purposely didn't do that at the end of the 20th century, and her multiple books helped demonstrate that. There's also the Association for Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies, ISIS. They now have a calendar that has every single talk, this talk is on there, every single talk in the US being done on this topic. So if you're into this, nerd out. Um, I think there were 18 today. So we're working on it. We're trying to get the info out. The experts, we're, we're coming at you. Um, so yeah, you have to look on the left-hand side of that page where you see resources. But they also have resources to help Ukrainian scholars if that interests you. And if you're interested in international relations in general, ISU, we are back to being in person. We are trying to be back for the public. And so next week we do the Frank, Frank Church Symposium where uh, it's not just a Russia-Ukraine. It is really thinking broadly about global peace. So you'll have panels that will tap into this. I will be on one of those panels, but we're also gonna talk about Afghanistan, other things. And then there's other panels that I'm not on. So you'll only have to listen to my voice for a little bit if you go, but, uh, the Frank Church Symposium is coming up next week, and I highly encourage you all to attend. So on that note, let's do a question and answer. True.